welcome to Central News, I'm Hilary Entwistle. In today's news, a series of workshops will be held around Tauranga City by the Council for suggestions and public feedback on what makes a city age-friendly before the age-friendly strategy is drafted. The Tauranga City Council's initiative will be a nation first, but is following a World Health Organisation example. The age-friendly strategy will aim to help people age in place and look at the environmental and social factors that contribute to active and healthy ageing. Tauranga's age concern, Angela Scott, says the strategy may improve everyday life for the ageing population. Well, it's not something that's going to happen just for the few weeks that the strategy and the survey are on. This is something which goes over weeks, months and years. And what we're hoping is that real communities will develop and support older people. And I think it's going to make a huge difference when you find people are working together uh, and they'll be happier and live longer and live independently, which is what we want. Philanthropist Owen Glenn is funding an inquiry into New Zealand's child abuse statistics and the prevention of domestic violence. The Glenn Inquiry's think tank now consists of over 36 international and local academics that will research and hear from anyone with an experience of domestic violence. Think Tank's Dr Neville Robinson says the think tank is becoming known as the People's Inquiry. Overall, the inquiry is being um, positioned as the people's inquiry. We want to hear from people who have been involved uh, or who are working with people who are involved in domestic violence and, and child abuse. And our role is to hear what they have to say, evaluate it, pull from it what seem to be promising ideas for what works, identifying some of the problems and helping to shape some recommendations for change. The summer has been certainly warmer, which has brought the tourists to the Bay of Plenty, but the absence of oil on the beach has helped. Tourism Bay of Plenty believe this summer has been a lot more lucrative than last and has seen our beaches back to their normal busy capacity. Communications manager Katie Cox says this has definitely been a better summer, but the Rena disaster brought the community together and the effects of that are still being felt this summer. The upside to the numbers lost last year and the environmental impact caused by the arena is that it's really brought our community together and we realize what a huge impact and asset our tourism industry is to the region. Um, we, we've gone from really grasping those tourists who just come over the summer months, the holiday season, to broadening our horizons and looking forward to setting up year-round events and festivals that will be a great draw card to our region throughout the year. Now for our region's weather, and we can hang the washing back out tomorrow. Wednesday for you, Hamilton, will be fine with a southerly dying out. Your expected high is 23 and an overnight low of 9. Tauranga, your Wednesday is looking fine with a cool southerly dying out in the afternoon. Your expected high is 23 and an overnight low of 13. Just ahead, a new counselling service in Tauranga. Welcome to Central News on TV Central. The silly season is almost behind us, but will be about now that some women may be finding out about some unexpected results. You may have seen the billboards around Tauranga for Pregnancy Choice, a new counselling service, for those facing the difficult decision around unplanned pregnancy. I found out what Pregnancy Choice offers. Well, Pregnancy Choice is a non-profit organisation. It's voluntary. And it was set up in Tauranga in August last year to meet the needs of those uh, girls, women, facing a crisis pregnancy and don't really know what to do. They've met with the news that help, I'm, I'm pregnant, and what to do next. Um, I, I think it, when, even when you have a normal pregnancy and you've got support and it's planned, it can still be a very scary time. So for those that, yeah, it's a real shock, it wasn't meant to happen, um, they just don't, aren't necessarily equipped to know how to deal with it and what to do. So why did you start Pregnancy Choice? Okay, well I've been involved in pregnancy counselling type work uh, for 20 years now. And I felt that I could make a difference. So knowing that it is a stressful time, uh, knowing after having four children myself that I have a bit of an experience there, and uh, yeah, just that I could help make a difference. And, and we have a team of reps as well, so along we have eight representatives that, that help in that area. 
What choices are there available to someone who may find themselves unexpectedly pregnant? Okay, well there's, there's three obvious ones. Uh, the first one is to keep the baby. Um, it may not have been on their agenda right then to, uh, to keep the baby, but maybe a bit of a change of plans is needed and it may not be the end of the world as they might have thought that they can keep the baby. And sometimes it ends up really enriching their lives. We've had people come back and go, hey, look, I really had not planned for this baby, but well, I'm just so glad that I did. So yes, keeping the baby is one option. It also can be challenging that uh, babies do cry and they do keep you up at night. Um, but generally it also is also rewarding for them. Okay, so their second option is there's the adoption option where they can, uh, we say, give their baby a gift of them carrying the baby for nine months and then choose a family that they might like to adopt the baby out to. Uh, adoption's interesting, it's had a bit of bad press in the past, but these days it is quite different and you can have an open adoption where the mother can choose the parents, maybe the religion, um, the cultural values, uh, what sports they want to be involved in. They can decide if they want to have photos, how much contact they want. So really, it is a lot easier than it ever used to be. So that's the second option. Uh, the third option is to have an abortion. Now, they need to think carefully about an abortion because it is very final. It's nothing that they can undo. And there are consequences to the woman's health and her mental health, so she does need to think carefully about it. And we encourage them not to rush, just to look into all the information. And I guess that's where we come in, because we want to sit down with them, present the truth, the facts, and let them make their own choice. What are the, some of the emotions that a woman or a girl may actually find during that decision process? Um, they often are worried about telling their parents or a spouse, they're anxious, they, yeah, it's panic, it's like, whoa, what to do next? So we like to just sit with them and talk to them, hear those worries, and like for some of them, like ones that have been worried about telling their parents, once they do, it actually wasn't that bad. <laughs> parents were a little surprised, but then they go, hey, look, we're here for you. You mentioned abortion. What is the process that we have here in New Zealand when someone wants an abortion? Okay, well the first thing they need to do is see their doctor. And the doctor will decide if they meet the New Zealand criteria for having an abortion, which is basically if there's serious danger to their physical or mental health, or if there's a problem with the baby. There are other um, areas too. Um, if they meet that criteria, they'll then refer them to a consultant and they have to have two consultants that um, will decide whether, again, that they are ready for the abortion. Um, they'll go through to an abortion clinic. They see a counsellor there briefly and then they will take a few pills um, and then go through the table and the procedure. I think it takes about 15 minutes, something like that. Um, and then they have a short time in recovery and uh, they're home. How can that actually affect a woman emotionally? Well, emotionally, it's tricky and it can really vary because every woman is different. For some, it's immediate relief. Oh, it's over. Um, but for others, it's, oh my goodness, what have I just done? And, and for those, it is, it is really hard because they then wish that they still were pregnant and they wish that they were holding their baby. How, does one, how do you guys help people deal with that? We, are, we encourage them to get back in touch with us and we run a post-abortion uh, healing course that's over 10 weeks and just help them work through that. Um, it's interesting in a recent New Zealand survey with uh, Professor Ferguson, he found that women who had abortions were 30% more likely to have mental health issues than those who hadn't had an abortion. Interesting enough, also those that continued their pregnancy, even though it wasn't planned, had no mental health issues. So um, yeah, it is tricky afterwards, and, but we are there for them to help support. 
Visit their website, pregnancychoice.org.nz or phone 0800 PregChoice. Coming up, we look at quad bike safety. Welcome back. There have been a number of accidents involving quad bikes recently and with an average of two children losing their lives to these accidents a year, many are arguing it's time something be done. Amy spoke with the New Zealand Transport to find out how our regions shape up against the rest of the country. Yeah, the period between 2005 and 2012, we've had 14 accidents, though in January of this year we've had an extra two, so that's 16 in total. Okay, so this was uh, just in the Waikato and Bay of Plenty alone. So of these accidents, how many people were injured and how many people were involved? Okay, there's been 27 people that have been involved and we've had nine serious accidents. And how do the national statistics compare to our region's results? Okay, over the whole of the country from that 2005 to 2012 period, we've had 108 people that have been injured, of which nine fatalities and 45 serious injuries. And so what are the uh, current requirements for, for driving a quad bike? So you've got to have a driver's licence to start with. If you're driving on a public road, you need at least a Class 1 licence, which is a car licence, or you can have a learner's motorbike licence. Either of those will allow you to drive on the road. The vehicle has also got to be registered. You've got to pay your annual registration or licence fee, and it has to have a current warrant of fitness. Okay, so do these rules vary for farm use? Yeah, farm use is a special category and what happens for farm use is um, one, you've still got to have it registered, you've still got to have it uh, licensed and is in paying your annual licence fee, but in terms of the licence fee you don't have to pay the ACC component of that. The vehicle doesn't have to have a warrant of fitness, but it does have to be up to a road a quality of, of being able to drive on the road. And if you keep driving below 30 kilometres an hour, you don't have to wear a helmet. And so that's only for farmers that are either using the public road to access their farm or a runoff that they have that is close to the farm and is run as part of that farming, farming operation. Okay, so as you say, uh, the, the rules vary with wearing a helmet on the farm. So about a quarter of injuries sustained uh, with quad bike accidents are to the head. How can we get the important message out about wearing a helmet? Yeah, as you say, I mean, wearing a helmet is really important and it is a safety feature. So though people don't need to wear it, um, we certainly suggest they do. And I suppose what we're trying to do is we try to educate the public, so we put out information ACC puts out information and when we talk about accidents uh, on the TV about quad bikes we certainly try to emphasise whether a person was wearing a helmet or wasn't so it becomes if you like uh, second nature to put your helmet on because it is a safety feature. Mm. And so at least 30 children are hospitalised every year from quad bike injuries so what are your thoughts on, on banning under 16 year olds from, from riding quad bikes? Yeah I mean that's a difficult one because if you live on a farm you have to go and get the cows in, you actually are going to use the quad bike in reality. So we're not suggesting, well, my personal opinion is we shouldn't be banning people from using it, but what we should be doing is encouraging parents, caregivers to actually provide support, training, um, advice on how you should be using that vehicle. And so under 16 year olds know how to use it safely. Mm. Um, and saying that there are other options as well. So in some instances, it may be better to use just an ordinary motorbike, other means of transport. And so as you say, um, many children on the farm use quad bikes. I mean, it, it's it's just a fact of life. That's how they're getting around the farm. So what can families do to ensure their safety? I think it's very much about, it's the same as um, teaching your teenager to drive a car. You actually want them to drive safely, so you provide support for them. You actually go out, you show them how to use the vehicle safely. You provide support and advice on um, where they don't have that knowledge, that skill set. Um, and you, you, when you start out, you don't let them do it unsupervised, so you're actually there supervising them, training them, showing them how to do it. In addition to that, there are courses that you can um, go on. Mm -hmm. 
um, to actually learn a great deal more about how to drive a vehicle safely. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't just need to be the family or the supporters of the family that do it. There is uh, courses that provide that sort of information as well. Okay, where can people find out about these courses? So there's a number of websites that actually have good information about the quad bikes. ACC has um, a lot of information that's really good. Federated Farmers have it on their website mm -hmm. as well. If you go to the local um, bike shop where you actually buy the bike, they've got a lot of information that's available. Mm -hmm. And the NZTA website has a fact sheet, number 19, that has information about driving quad bikes, what are the licensing requirements, those sorts of things. Okay, and so what sort of things will be involved with the course? Uh, it's Using a quad bike is different to driving a motorbike. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people assume it's the same. So what they do is they teach you how to drive safely and what are the different reflexes you need, um, how the vehicle will handle differently to an ordinary um, motorbike, mm -hmm. uh, what sort of safety gear you should be wearing, give you advice about actually purchasing a vehicle, mm -hmm. and also give you ideas of where you can go and drive it. Yeah. Okay, so. One of the problems is that children and teen teenagers often think that they're, they're bulletproof. So how can we teach them the dangers that are involved with quad bikes or, or riding any bikes of that sort? Uh, I think it, it really stems from the parents. I mean, they're the first source of knowledge for children uh, driving bikes. So it's very much around um, being there and enabling them to drive. So it's not trying to stop them driving, but it's providing advice and supervision on how they should do it and explaining the different concepts of what they need to do. I mean, the other thing you have to understand is a teenager's brain isn't so well developed as an adult, so they, they react differently. Um, they need to be able to drive safely so they, they need to drive slower and they need the advice and they need peer support so it's all of those things combined that actually will allow the kids to drive safely. Just ahead we look at ways to prevent sudden infant death syndrome and what's believed can be some contributing factors. If you have just joined us welcome to Central News. With the warmer weather and more people holidaying, it can be a stressful time for new parents. The Bay of Plenty District Health Board is looking at an initiative to provide PP pods to babies that may be at risk of sudden infant death syndrome. I spoke with a midwife leader to learn more about sudden infant death. It's when a baby dies and it wasn't expected to die. It's got no chronic disease, it had no factors that indicated that this baby was going to die. So one day mum just goes in there and finds that her baby has died in its sleep. So what is actually believed to lead to that? Um, there's are risk factors such as um, smoking and pregnancy can lead to that. But there's also the bed sharing, and that's what Sudi's actually all about, is about safe sleeping for infants. And it's not trying to break up the tradition or the practice of a lot of cultures because they do share their beds, that, that's norm for them. But what we've got to do is create an environment that is actually safe for the baby to share the same bed as its parents. There's also um, practices um, and that's what we have to teach all the um, staff that work with babies, the midwives, the GPs, so that they can then educate the parents about safe sleeping practices. And that's about putting babies on it back, face clear and a smoke free environment. What is the most common way that we're finding that children are being suffocated in their sleep? Bed sharing. Um, the child sleeping with its parents and um, it could be that the parents do roll onto the baby and um, suffocate the baby that way. This is why we advise them not to drink alcohol and then take their baby into the beds with them. Um, it could be that mum is just so tired and she's sat up in bed breastfeeding the baby and she's fallen asleep and the baby's roll and rolled on top of the baby. Um, there's also practices of using pillows for babies and that tilts baby's head and blocks off baby's airways. So it comes back once again to everybody giving the same message of safe sleeping, having baby on its back, face clear and a smoke free environment. Because you are advising mothers not to co-sleep, why? When we're saying about not promoting co-sleeping, what we're saying is that there are things such as the pepe pods and the wahakuras that they can use 
to put in the middle of the bed and put the baby in there and the baby's got its own sleeping space in the parent's bed. It's all about safety. So how does a wahakura and a pee pee pod work? Well, it means the baby's got its own sleeping space which is perfectly safe but it's within the reach of the parents, so parents may choose to put it in the bed with them in between them, and then both parents can still touch the baby. Um, baby has got the closeness of its parents that way, but it's got its own sleeping space, and that's the key message. The DHB is issuing these pee -pee pods to babies that they're actually identifying as being at risk. What makes a baby at risk? There's a number of factors, um, premature babies, um, full-term babies that are a low birth weight and um, parents that smoke. Um, there also can be social issues such as the parents can't afford bedding for the babies um, and things like that. So what we want to do is promote an environment for the baby that the baby's going to be safe. And so we have been given some funding for some peppy pods. And any of these babies that are identified as being at risk, or if the midwife refers them and says, look, we've got concerns and things like that, well, then we can issue a peppy pod. The thing with the peppy pods is that they can't be recycled. The mattresses and things like that can't be recycled. So it needs a good process of following up who's been given the peppy pod how they're using it and what happens to it um, when they no longer need it anymore. Sudden infant death syndrome or sudden unexpected death of an infant is unfortunately one of the leading causes of children from one month to a year. It's a very awful, uh, unfortunate statistic in New Zealand. Are we any closer to a reason why? I think through the promotion of safe sleeping and the use of peppy pods and the message of being smoke free in your pregnancy and, and ensuring that the baby is in a smoke free environment and that includes the, the house, the car, um, people tend to forget that they'll say oh, my house is smoke free or I don't smoke in the car but I go outside to smoke but they forget they're actually bringing the smoke back in on their clothing so it even goes one step further that if if they have to smoke that they use something on clothing whatever that they can remove when they come in and be in contact with the baby the baby is getting secondhand smoke which is just as bad as smoking over the baby there is a great website, changeforourchildren.co.nz and that has a whole lot of information about everything you need to know to protect your baby. That is the news for today. We really want you to be involved, so like us on Facebook and let us know your views. If you have your own news, including a video and photos, go to our website and hit upload. Thanks for joining us. I'll be back tomorrow night for more guests from in and around the regions. I'm Hilary Entwistle. Have a lovely evening. This has been an Alpha Media production, a division of Television Media Group. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.